rest of us grows in the United States, and I, and I think the average CEO makes about 400 times that of the average American worker right now. Uh, guys like uh, Mr. Henwood are examining uh, uh, that, that gulf and uh, what, what created it and, and possibly what could close it in the next administration. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Henwood um, has, uh, has had, uh, was looking at his website recently. Uh, he, uh, his uh, his uh, stuff has been heavily barred by Jim Hightower, certainly one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, heroes. Um, Susie Bright has called him a wicked genius and uh, a former managing uh, executive editor of, uh, of the Wall Street Journal has called him scum and uh, uh, <laughs> which, 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 uh, which highly recommends me, him in my book. Uh, Mr. Hanwood, good morning, sir. Good, well, good morning to you. Good afternoon to uh, from here. <laughs> Where are you calling from? I'm in New York. Oh, very good. Uh, well, thank you for being on our show. And uh, the reason uh, I wanted to, uh, to invite you on the show is because uh, I understand you're something of an expert on stagflation, which we mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. Well, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure I specialize in stagflation, but I have been following this stuff pretty closely. It's uh, it's it's quite a challenge. I'm certainly glad I am not uh, serving in the Federal Reserve right now. It's uh, <laughs> a real policy challenge dealing with the present. Mm -hmm. Would you care to define stagflation for our listening audience? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, those of us who are uh, old enough to have lived through the '70s remember it very well. But uh, anybody, I guess, under the age of 40 probably doesn't. And uh, uh, the stag part comes from stagnation, and the flation part comes from inflation. It's a combination of slow growth and rising prices, which back in the 70s came as something of a surprise to ec economists and uh, market people, because we learned in school that uh, uh, when the economy slows, inflation slows, and when the economy accelerates, uh, inflation accelerates. Maybe not one for one and you know, in, in moment for moment, but uh, with a delay. Uh, but uh, we saw uh, a very different picture in the 70s with uh, growth pretty weak and uh, prices nonetheless rising. In fact, uh, the inflation in the 1970s was the, really the peak of uh, most inflationary spikes in the United States uh, for the last 200 years were associated with wars. So you'd have an inflation spike around a war, and then when the demobilization happened, uh, uh, prices would uh, settle back. Uh, this looked like a really permanent thing back in the 70s. We had the high and the rising inflation from the 50s into the 60s and into the 70s. It just kept going up and up and up, and it looked like it was completely out of control. Uh, at the same time, uh, the economy was weak, and then, of course, there were the oil shocks of uh, 1973, and then later in 79, uh, which brought uh, additional, through additional fuel, the inflationary fire. Uh, but what's different about it this time is that uh, back in the 70s, you also had a lot of labor militancy. Uh, there were more unions. Uh, unions had power. Uh, also, uh, workers uh, had developed a pretty bad attitude. They were uh, misbehaving on the job. Uh, we had a wildcat strike in the post office that had the army delivering mail at one point. And, you know, people forget that in uh, our, our standard narrative of the 70s, which was a time of you know, disco music and leisure suits. But there were also an awful lot of ma labor militancy, formal and informal, running around. So we don't have that this time. So there's not the kind of wage pressure uh, that, we're, we're, that we saw back then, which is the thing you really need to get an inflationary spiral going. This time, it's all about commodities. And one of the reasons it's such a challenge is that you can say the inflation of the 70s was at least in part the result of Federal Reserve indulgence. Uh, Arthur Burns, uh, the, who ran the Fed under Nixon, uh, was famous for having opened the monetary spigots to help Nixon win the 72 election, and uh, uh, that uh, caused uh, problems later on in the decade. Uh, but now it's not really such a monetary phenomenon. It's a real thing. We have uh, the energy uh, prices uh, zooming higher, certainly with the help of financial speculators, but there are also fundamental reasons for it. Uh, demand growing faster than supply. Uh, political instability in a lot of oil-producing regions. Uh, possibility that we're approaching peak in oil production and it's going to start declining. That's, that's a real thing, and it's not something a monetary pro policy can approach. And then there's also the problem of food inflation, uh, which uh, is not as dramatic as energy inflation, but causing a lot of problems among the poor of the world, even here at home. Uh, and that is at least in part the result of climate change. We've had crop failures, race crop failure, for example, in Australia, uh, extreme weather events in, in crop producing areas uh, in, in, in Asia as well, uh, which are at least in part due to climate change. So again, that's not a monetary issue. We're having to face a whole lot of really long-term research issue, uh, resource issues uh, and climate issues uh, that, you know, um, it doesn't get much more material than that, and uh, that's not something the Federal Open Market Committee can deal with very easily. 
All right, let me, uh, let me recap this. Uh, you've said a lot and all of it important. Let me recap this for our listening audience for a second. Uh, so flash, uh, stagflation is a stagnated economy uh, that's also experiencing uh, inflation. Uh, the Federal Reserve can't raise rates uh, because if it does raise rates, it will further depress the, the, the economy and perhaps move the economy from a recessionary mode into a, perhaps the, ne- the second uh, Great Depression. If the Fed lowers rates, uh, they're going to stimulate uh, inflation. And the other important point that you made is, so we're kind of bracketed in, and we're bracketed in for a period of time, and it's going to be prolonged and painful. Uh, The other important thing that you said is that there are important differences between uh, our our country's first experience with uh, with stagflation in the Jerry Ford era uh, and now, those two big differences being uh, the the very great scarcity of, of natural resources, particularly oil, um, and and also uh, the the climate changes due to global warming. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah, and also I think uh, the the labor issue, which I mentioned, we had a lot of uh, pressure coming on wages uh, from from worker militancy, formal and informal, uh, and uh, that was something that uh, Paul Volcker's great clampdown of 1979 to 82 really cured, uh, made uh, the cost at the expense of the American working class, but it uh, it really broke the back of that labor militancy and really changed the whole relationship between capital and labor. Uh, there's nothing like that now. I mean, labor is still very quiescent. Uh, people are happy to have a job. They're not going to make uh, too many demands, especially uh, with the unemployment rate creeping higher as it is. So that's another difference. Um, but all these, put all these things together, and it's just not something that the uh, Federal Reserve can deal with. And as you point out, that they're, they're obviously afraid of, uh, of any kind of serious tightening because uh, the financial system and the economy, the real economy, are both quite vulnerable right now, and they know it. Other central banks around the world are dealing with fundamentally stronger economies. They don't have the financial problems we do, and they're very worried about inflation. Um, But uh, here, uh, the Federal Reserve can issue tough-sounding statements, but they really can't do much, uh, much more than just talk right now. Doug, this is Jay. Um, a couple questions on on the on the uh, workers and, and the unions and such. 